Hello and welcome everybody to uh, today's webinar, which is the first one in the new year. Um, so with this, I think it's still not too late to wish all of you a happy new year um, with a lot of fun, a lot of success, and obviously a um, lot of health and safety. My name is Martin Karlovic. I'm CEO and co-owner of Netronic Software. I'm the host for today's webinar, and I will share with you um, some of the product features that we released shortly before Christmas. So for all our customers, we thought it would be good to have a Christmas gift in form of new features and functionality. And we delivered right in time for Christmas. And as um, the, the time frame or the time between release date and Christmas was too short, we thought we have the webinar in the new year when everybody is back from a hopefully relaxing and peaceful Christmas break. So um, housekeeping as always, and you know this, this is a webinar, you're all on mute. This is not because I'm not interested in engaging with you guys, but this is just because you wanna avoid background noises. Um, we are using uh, the GoToWebinar technology and the GoToWebinar technology as all these webinar products have chat functionality, so there is, a chat pane that you can use. So when you have a question, then please write the question. And um, there are two two scenarios. You have a question while I'm doing PowerPoints, then I will see your question immediately. And I, I most likely answer it right away. When I'm doing demos, I typically do not see the notification that there is a question. So then I will see it once I come back from the demo. Um, to uh, PowerPoint, and then I will answer the question. Then, from time to time, questions turn out to be too tricky or to be too off-topic, given the topic of the webinar. Then uh, I will definitely say, hey, I, I got the question, and we will come back via email. So please, 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 um, don't take uh, the fact that you're muted wrong, but please engage, please ask questions, please challenge me. The more questions the get, I get typically, the more happier I leave the webinar. Um, so as this is a what is new in these three products webinar, um, please do not expect me to make a general introduction into what the VAPS is, into what the VPS is, into what the VJS is. So these types of webinars typically are good for people who are familiar with our products and just want to see what is new so this is like showing incremental functionality and not explaining everything from scratch i will make sure that in the first quarter of the year we will run introductory webinars on uh, vaps vps and vjs for so for those of you who are new just watch out to the uh, announcements they will come i think definitively in february time frame um so there we will make sure that, that we get some, some introductory content out for you. But today it is more like showing new functionality. So I I work on the assumption that you're familiar with the visual advanced production scheduler, the visual production scheduler, and the visual job scheduler. So in terms of um, our release policy, um, we are now in a in a in a phase where we release one new product version per quarter. That means that with VPS and VJS, we started a bit earlier when it comes to Business Central. We are now, we shipped, just shipped the 14th version of the product. Um, so we are now on version 1.13 with the VAPS where we started two years ago. I mean, now it's two years ago that we run the VAPS. Amazing uh, how fast time goes. Um, this is now the ninth version that we ship, so we are on version 1.8, and with some clockwork-wise reliability, we we ship one new version per quarter. Every version includes bug fixes. We always do some housekeeping, some internal work. We will, we ship typically new features and functions, and since earlier last year, we also provide new events and objects. So all uh, VPS, VJS, and VAPS, they have a documented uh, API and application programming interface. So we will provide events and objects so that partners actually can extend our extensions by building 
extensions that base on our extension so that you can individualize and customize the experience. Whenever we release a version, we actually go to Microsoft um, and submit the version for App Source and only after Microsoft approved the version on AppSource, so only after the version is being available or is available on AppSource, we kind of now send out the release notes and say, hey, here is the new version. Um, and a lot of the new functions that we build is actually functions where um, some of you had an idea and turned turned uh, came back to us. So whenever you have a new idea, what should be in the VPS, what do you want to see in the VJS or what do you want to see in the VAPS, just talk to us. We are really happy to get ideas. We are really get uh, happy to get feedback. Of course, we won't do everything um, immediately. And sometimes also some of the questions are too specific, then we would actually try to see if we can build events and objects so that you then can like make this individualization with your own extension, but only seldomly we really fully turn down an idea. So if you have ideas, if you have thoughts, please, please, please share them with us. So when you see this, um, uh, there is, did you see, there's a lot of track, uh, 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 a good um, a track record here of re steadily increasing uh, releasing products. We have three products, and um, when when we only talk here right now, extensions for Business Central. And then when you think about having three products, we also should think about the Business Central version. So um, Microsoft does not do a release every quarter, but they do a release every half year. As you know, this means right now we have Business Central 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. So this is uh, six Business Central versions, if I counted this right, times three products. This is 18 different versions of a product that we have to ship with every release. And so far we have been doing this. However, um, we came into some issues with this. The, the first issue was that um, because Business Central is evolving rapidly, we sometimes had the case that we were developing a new functionality on the latest Business Central version, and then we wanted to kind of um, compile this to an older BC version, say to version 15 or version 16, and then um, things that worked with Business Central 19 a broke with Business Central 15. So basically, um, this forced us in situations where we had to develop the same function multiple times so that it could um, work with all BC version. Plus, some of the BC versions that were released between 14 and now um, are already out of support from Microsoft because Microsoft introduced the new um, the modern life cycle. And at the end of the year, basically with shipping this release, we also said that we really thought about the product life cycle and we decided also to streamline our product life cycle. So we keep having these three products, VAPS, VPS, and VJS. Um, but I highly recommend that you um, that you uh, um, that you write down these link www.electronic.com slash extensions minus lifecycle. It brings you to a very long blog post that I wrote, and this blog post also um, links to other pages on our website where we really explain what we are doing, why we are doing it, and which versions we support. But the general decision that we had to take, because we now see Business Central 20 coming, and this would bring us from 18 products to 21 products, and then later this year, um, it would bring us from 21 to 24 products, and so on and so forth, um, and always uh, making sure that every feature we build complies with every new Business Central version. This was became just a nightmare in terms of development. So we decided to align our release policy with Microsoft's modern lifecycle when it comes to the Business Central extensions. This means in general, we no longer guarantee a backward comp compatibility of every new feature which means it, it, it may happen that we build, or it will happen that we build a new feature. And then this is available for Business Central version 19 right now, because this is the current version, but it will no longer be available for Business Central 16 or 14, because this just, because Business Central changes so fast, if we build on version 19, 
Microsoft does not guarantee that we, what we build on version 19 works on version 14 or version 15. And so, as said, we had cases where we developed one feature a couple of times to just support all business central version, this time three product, this every half year and for us every quarter, just insane. And so, likewise, we eventually stop support for business central and NAV versions that are no longer supported by Microsoft because it may be that you come across a VPS issue. Um, and then we look into this and we recognize, okay, this issue is actually um, related to a version that is no longer supported with Microsoft. Then Microsoft wouldn't fix this issue. Hence, we couldn't fix the issue, but you would pay maintenance service from us, and this would be for a maintenance for service that we could not deliver because the underlying system is out of maintenance. And concretely, this means um, what we do and what we, what we can commit to is that we provide bug fix support for the current and the previous two business central versions. Let me, let me just add this here to make it clear. BC versions. Um, so we guarantee support for the current and for the previous two business central version. And we also guarantee, of course, that when we ship new functionality, that it works with the current business central version. And what we really aim at, we really aim at that, this, that we build the function in a way that it supports the current business central version and also the previous two versions. But I consciously say we aim at because we don't want to give the guarantee that this will always be the case. There might be cases that when Microsoft comes up with Business Center 20, we build something for Business Center 20 and we see that we make use of functionality that Microsoft introduced to Business Center 20, which was not part of uh, Business Center 19. And then we would have to build the same feature again. And again, given that we have three products and that we release every quarter, this would just be um significantly increasing our workload and then we wouldn't be able to cope with every change that is happening and with all the requirements that you have so with the versions that we shipped in december and we managed to make them available for business central 17 18 and 19 but this also means the things that i will show you today that are new they are not available for business central 14 15 and 16 um because we have some of the functions that we just built, built on technology and built on functionality that just came in Business Central 19. Um, they seamlessly worked with 17 and 18, but they broke when we came to the older versions of Business Center. So this is something we will apply for now. And this is nothing that we invented, but we really now decided to follow what Microsoft is doing. So we Let's say we decided to follow the ecosystem's best practice that we are in. So with this, let's look what we shipped for BC, for the uh, three products for BC 19, uh, 18, and 17. Um, on the and we had a, a huge focus on the VAPS this time. So with the VAPS, we didn't change anything uh, on the on the API, um, but what we made across all three products is that we uh, introduce the capability in a sales order view and production order view in the VAPS, in the production order view in the VPS, and in the uh, uh, jobs view in the VJS to also sort by status. So we had the capability to sort in the table part of the visual schedule with the previous version. Um, and now we enhance this capability so that you can also sort by status and I will show you in a minute. Then for VAPS and VPS, um, we now save the collapse and expand status. And this means if you collapse or expand work centers or histograms or whatever, and then you leave the visual scheduler and they come back, then then the the product still knows what, what's your last visual setting and it will bring you back exactly where you left off before. So this is like major new functionality, um, uh, like this makes things just easier for you and reduces the initial clicks that are needed before you actually can start the work. Then we, we had like one big block of features is something that I would summarize under the headline, we, we, de uh, we provide more or we increased the scheduling COM4. So we just wanted to add a couple of more COM4 functions that just help us achieve, achieve certain scheduling actions earlier. 
Um, in order to do so, we first had to refine, uh, decided to, to refine the apply routing function. So this is not new. We just refined it and we sharpened it in the way it works. And I will show you in a minute. Um, then we have the add all function that moves all non-scheduled operations to the schedule. And in the past, we built it in a way that it always started from what we call the scheduling start. But when you had planned operations on the standby resource in the past, so left from the work date, this did not get taken into account. Now this is also taken into account because if you have an operation on standby that is left from the work date, well, um, then either this is data rubbish, which means you would have to delete it in Business Central, or if this a not yet planned production order that, that you should have planned in the past, then well, with this function, we make you, we help you to quickly check, schedule it. Then we give you also the um, capability to move past operations to the standby. So use case is you have operations that you scheduled to happen yesterday. For some reason, nobody worked on them. So now if you look at the visual schedule, they are still scheduled to a machine. So with the new function, you can move them all up to standby and then with at all, they get scheduled. And likewise, we can say from a given point of time, we want to move everything to standby again and to schedule new. So this helps to quickly schedule new operations from a given uh, 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 point in time. Then we allow to set selected machine and work centers to infinite capacity. So by default, the visual advanced production schedule works with finite capacity. Um, but we heard often, we heard customers oftentimes saying, okay, we have a machining part and we have whatever, a packaging part or whatever. And we want to uh, we want to schedule the machining part very granular with finite capacity because this is our bottleneck, and we want to make sure that we uh, that we schedule this as good as can. But whenever we are done in machining and it goes to packaging, we don't care. They, they, the packaging just takes what it gets from machining and they pack it. So we don't need to be granular there. And in order to facilitate this case, we just okay, we can select the machine work center to be no longer granular, but but schedule with infinite capacity again. Um, in order to make this e to, 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 so that this does not um, create some like visual noise, we also now allow you to show operations either overlapped or stack. And then we have the capability for certain items that we exclude them from the uh, earliest material availability date calculation. And then last but not least, we now facilitate or the, the VAPS also supports cases where customers just have work centers and not machine centers. So in the past, we had the case, we always, because we have this concept with a standby resource, in the past, we always only created a standby resource if there was at least one machine center under a work center. Um, so initially, the VAPS was built on the assumption that every customer has machine centers. We learned that there are a lot of customers actually who don't use machine centers, so they stick on work center level. Um, and now if you just have work centers, you still will get the standby resource and then you can schedule on the work center currently and for the time being still with the assumption that the capacity of the work center is like with the capacity of the machine center, it is one. This is something we will tackle over the course of the year. I can't give you timing information about now, but right now the assumption is we treat a work center and a machine center by default with a capacity of one or if you explicitly say with infinite capacity. So a lot of stuff that we will see in a minute on the VAPS. With the VPS, we actually enhance the API so that um, we give a new event to reload the VAPS after the view filter is applied so that you can, uh, can control also from the outside what you see. And we created events so that you can interact with the product before you schedule, before you save, and after you save a production order routing line, so an operation. So this gives you a lot of control what, so that you can in, that you can kind of take influence from the outside before an operation is scheduled, before it is saved, and after it is saved, and this opens a plethora of use cases. I talked about this before, and then we, we um, have the reload button in the VPS where whenever something changes in Business Center, you can push reload and then we um, 
uh, we fetch the new data from Business Central. In the past, um, um, this was not built in the in the most straightforward way. So now, really, we just do an incremental. So first, we we fetch those things that got added to Business Central, and if things in Business Central got changed, then we fetch them as well. But if things that we have in the VPS did not get changed in Business Central, then we don't need reload them again. So we just massively, uh, with some intelligence, massively reduced the number of things that we have to touch when we reload. And by this, we gained some measurable performance improvements. And then what we started with the VPS, because the VPS is the manual production scheduler, um, we want to um, kind of, and if, if things are manual, you can run into much more conflicts than if you do something automated as with the VAPS. So as this is manual, we kind of added a new capability to provide warnings to the user so that in case you create conflicts, which happen easily when you do everything manual, that you see them quicker. So we added actually warning symbols in the table part of the visual schedule to indicate resource workloads. With the VJS, nothing on the on the API side of things yet. Um, I talked about sorting by status, and then we just enhanced and extended two existing functionalities. We uh, enhanced the way of how you can configure tooltips. So now you can also build custom tooltips for the resource group and for the resources. So this was something that we didn't have in the past. And um, also, we enhance filtering capability, so we just make the filters work better and more powerful when resource group and resource filters are applied. So now this is the overview of what we do, and now I, I want to show this to you. I will focus on VAPS on VPS, so I will focus on the production scheduling products because this is something concerning functionality we we already had in the past, so we make you can build more tooltips and there is an enhancement in filtering capabilities but i spoke about filtering capabilities in the past a lot i think i had a webinar just on filtering um, sometimes last year and we talked about a lot about tooltip configuration in the previous webinar so as this is more or less the only one we built for the vjs i will skip this in the demo and focus the demo on the VAPS and the v, uh, VPS, so on the Visual Advanced Production Scheduler and on the Visual Production Scheduler. And with this, let me get to Business Central. And start off with the VPS. So this is the VPS, this is the production order view. And in the production order view, you see that the production orders I have here in my system are so, um, sorted in the production order view by status and then here by production order number. So what we already did in the last version is we gave you uh, the capability to, to kind of sort the information you see here and in the previous version, you could sort it here on the um, routing level, or you could sort it here on the production order line level, or you could sort it on the production order level. Um, so if I want to see, like, have this sorted by due date, I can just click right. This is right mouse click sort order. And then I can say, okay, I'm sorting on a production order, um, on a production order uh, value, and I take the due date. And I want to have this in ascending. So then the production order that is at next is first. So this is something that we shipped with the last version. And then in December, we also made this context menu available here on the production order status line. So now, right now, I can say, okay, I want to sort order by the production order status. And then I can decide if I want to um, uh, uh, sort by the status number, by the status, by the status name, or whatever. So I take the number. Um, I do it in descending order, nothing happens, so I need to change the status number, I think, and then 
or the status. Let me take the status number. So, and if I do this, then demo effect. I tried this before, nothing happened. Let me try it again. Let me switch it to descending. Okay, now you see I have the released and then I have the firm plant and then I have the plant. And now this view to me makes perfectly sense. I have the release production orders first. These are the ones um, that are most critical to me. And then I have the one first that has the next, the due date from now. So um, building the view like this is now perfectly possible. So um, this is one of the things that we did and we have the same uh, short by status, the same in the VJS and in the VAPS. So I won't show you in the VAPS. The next thing is, um, and there let me switch to the, um, let me change the view and go to the capacity view. And typically when you open the VPS, it looks like this. So you have the work center group and you have the work centers. And then in other, under the work centers, you have machine centers and you're interested in drilling and you're interested in your, what happening, milling and turning. Maybe you, you don't care for your saw, but you're interesting for welding. And then you see when you open this, what the first thing that you do is you expand all of this. And you say, oh, from time to time, like milling two, and drilling one histogram is just meaningful to me. I want to see this. And in the past, when you did this collapse and expand thing and left the VPS and came in the VPS again, um, you had to do this again. You had all these clicks again to expand and collapse. And now the product remembers where you left off and you see, it's like before, everything that I expanded before, like all the machine centers with the exception of, of sawing and the histogram on drilling one and, and milling two, like it's all expanded and collapsed. So this expand and collapse status is now something that the, both the VPS and the VAPS remember, which I think it's, it's quite, it's a small thing, but a huge usability uh, increase because it just reduces the number of clicks that you have to do before you start to work because it, it you you come you come back to the software and it, it knows where you left off before so i think quite cool actually so now next thing and this is um, like as i said this is a manual product the vps and so with a manual product you can create a lot of conflicts and one of the conflicts of course is you can overload a machine so that for if for some reason i decide or i came to the idea that this operation cannot start here on this 2nd of february but should start the next day then i can move this and as we are have no finite capacity scheduling here, but just mirror the business central logic, I can create an overlap. So now I have here at some moment in time um, on this machine center, which is called quality control one, I have a slight overlap, okay? And, and like typically these overloads are not allowed. So what you might have noticed is that when I, let me restore this to initial value so that we uh, make it, make it um, as it was before. So that this, this is what it was. And so now what I will do, I will move it to the right hand side again. And I ask you to look at this part of the screen. So I move it to the right. I create the overload. And then you see some symbols here. And the interesting thing is you also see some symbols here next to this table right to this capacity table to this time scale uh, thing so even if we scroll up and now we don't see the work center or the machine center where the overload is i i see this extra row here and i see this symbol and this symbol tells me hey in my schedule there is an overload but it is not where we are here but it is further down in the schedule so the arrow points down which means I can scroll down and then I see actually, hey, okay, um, there is nothing, no symbol on machining, no symbol on drilling, no symbol on milling. So I know there are no issues, right? This is for the entire schedule. I know 
there is an issue somewhere in the schedule, then I have no warnings in all of this machining department. But hey, I see my issue is somewhere in finishing. Okay. And then I come here, assembly, no issue. But then I see how actually there is an issue in this work center. So this work center symbol here is red, but it is not on the work center level, but it is down on a machine center level. And then actually I see here is just this symbol that tells me, hey, the issue is on that machine center. So with this, um, when you open a schedule and even like if you if you open the schedule and it looks like this and you are you are here in february and if you have this bar you know this this row open you know hey okay somewhere in my schedule is an overload then you can quickly scroll down and say okay hey actually okay this is in finishing um and if you have it like this and this, then you know, ah, okay, it's not in assembly, but it's quality to control. You can open it. And then, okay, it's obviously not in this time frame. And then you can scroll left and right. And then you see, ah, okay, here is the overload. Here is the, uh, where the line uh, gets the double, double the height. So I think this is really pretty cool. This is a small thing um, from the visualization, but I think, again, big increase in usability that we have this extra row here to show symbols in case of conflicts and this makes like problem diagnostics uh, much faster and i think this is more important actually in a manual tool than an automatic tool so we started with these kind of um these kind of function functionality in the vps we we uh, also kind of will discuss and have some ideas where and how in the VAPS we could do something like this, but we wanted to test it and play around with this new way of visualization in the VPS first, because the need for having visual alerts is much higher in a manual tool than it is an automatic tool. So these are the things we, we did for the, uh, uh, VA, uh, for the VPS. So now let's go and look at the VPS, VAPS. And the VAPS has also the save collapse expansion and has uh, the sort by status, um, but there is much more in the VAPS. So let's switch to the VAPS. Let me create a simulation first. Um, and I, I won't explain what simulation is because just um, I have explained it a lot of times and we will do it in an introductory webinar to the VAPS again. So now I'm on the VAPS, and um, you see, looks pretty much as we what we saw before. And now let's just have one case. You see, I have a pretty solid schedule here, and here is a new production order that is on the standby resource. So now, in the past, and we have. And from the standby resource, which means this was added to business central, and from the standby resource in the past, or from the standby resource, you need to bring it to the schedule. And one of the options to bring it to the schedule is on the right mouse click to say apply routing. In the past, when we did this, we um, we assumed an earliest start date being the date that it got from Business Central. So when we did apply routing in the past, the earliest place where we could position it was actually here where it was positioned by Business Central. So when you did this and the schedule was empty like it is in my case, it just moved straight down. Now what we said is when we apply standard routing, because the basic concept or the, the fundamental concept of the VAPS is it is an ASAP and as soon as possible scheduler. We just said, okay, also when we do apply standard routing, the earliest potential start date should be determined by the scheduling start. This is where scheduling starts. It should be determined by what is happening on the machines and it should be determined by the earliest material availability date. So here with this item, I have no constraints on material. So um, 
I have just constraints on the scheduling by the scheduling start and by what is scheduled on the machine. So now if I say apply routing, um, it follows the as soon as possible principles, um, as soon as possible forward scheduling principles of the VAPS and looks for the earliest places available in the schedule and then schedules it like this. Um, so we make sure that we add it here at the end to the machine queue because there are no gaps on this machine so far. So this is one of the things that we refined the apply routing function. The other function is when we look at the schedule, um, we actually, and when we closely look, let me very closely look, and here this is the this is the production order status view. So the release production orders are in orange, the firm plan are in, are in blue. And as you know, when you have a release production order, you can post output or consumption to it. And when we ever we post output and consumption to it, this basically means that an operation is, start, is started. So if you start posting output or consumption to a production order, the pro, uh, to a production order line, a production order routing line, the production order routing line status changes, and then um, in, at first it is it is not defined, then it is called planned, then it is called in progress, and then it is finished. So whenever you start posting output or consumption on a production order routing line, and the production order routing line has the status started, then it gets this gray bar, and this gray bar is a progress V bar that tells you how much of this operation is already finished based on the output or the consumption uh, booking. If this is black line, then this is finished. So here the production order status, the production order routing line status is finished. So if you look, and this is the today line, this is the work date. So in my case, I have to update my demo system. I'm still on the 28th of January last year, um, but this is like to take this as the today line. So if we look left from the today line, we have a lot of stuff, black underscore, that is finished. We have some stuff that has not been booked as finished. So I would definitely check with my guys on the shop floor what is happening with this guy and with this guy. But if you very closely look, you see that there is this operation here from a production order that I wanted to do last week. Right, we are here. I want to do it last week. I want to do it a week ago, but it has no output, no consumption, so it is not yet started. And and this is now just one production order. But we had customers who had this case with a couple of production orders or a couple of operations per day. And in the past, you always would have to have in order to schedule it again. You would have to take it and then move it to here and then say schedule again. Right, so so in the past I had to take it here to stand by, or I had to take it and and drag and drop it to here to be in the today again. But if you have a couple of operations per day that are left over from yesterday that are neither started nor finished, then we saw customers doing a lot of manual stuff, which we didn't want them to do. So what we can do now is we can say under action schedule we can say move unhandled past operations to standby. And I think this is quite cool because it helps you to clean up the schedule. So first, if you do so, you and you see now this moved up, then you immediately see what kind of work you have left over from the past. What was scheduled to be started or finished in the past and is not yet done. So if you do this and you only have to look left from the work date, on the standby resource to see, okay, what is the work that is not yet done? And I only have one operation here, but just imagine you have you have six or seven, six or seven or eight or ten of these leftover uh, operations on average per day. Then this just makes your life easier. And then we have the add all function, and we have the add all including alternatives function. And in the past, this function always started on looking at what is next, what is right from the scheduling start, and we added this to the schedule, but we ignored the things from the past, and now we enhance this function that it also looks at what is on standby in the past, and then it brings it to the schedule right from the scheduling start, so that, that it brings it back to the schedule again. So now I can say schedule, add all, including alternatives, and now you see it got scheduled. I think it's it's here now. 
um, it got or, or here it got somewhere uh, no here it got added to the schedule here because here was some free spot on welding right so let me undo it and now you see this guy is here uh, in the past it was scheduled to be in the past it did materialize i moved it up and now i say okay now take everything that is on the standby resource and schedule it right from the scheduling start so schedule it definitely in the future i don't want to disturb my today's execution but at all take into account all alternatives and it it can squeeze it in here and now assume that you have, like, like I said, five leftover tasks from yesterday, one mouse click, get them all to standby, one mouse click to get them back into the schedule again. So this provides a lot of comfort. So then we, we saw that, that then you have a schedule and then you start to play around, you move this to here. Uh, and uh, let me just do some random tasks uh, and random things. And then you move, you say, okay, this one actually should go Okay, I can't go into there, but somehow somebody told me I need to do it later on the other milling machine and whatever. So um, you, you you start changing stuff. And the more you change, because this is a finite capacity scheduler, of course, the more the more chaos you start producing to the schedule, or the more the less effective the schedule can be. And then we had customers who asked us actually, but now if you do this, and then what do you do? to kind of create a new schedule. What do you do if you want to create a schedule from scratch? And then we said, well, then you have to go back, create a new simulation and start from scratch. But they said, but you know, what I have scheduled for next week is fine. I only want to schedule what is after next week maybe. And then what you can do now is we can move the scheduling start. We can say, okay, now we want to keep the time from today until the beginning of the 4th of February, we want to keep it stable. Or let me let me do it like we want to keep the next three days. We want to we want to keep today, tomorrow, next week, Monday. We want to keep it stable. But afterwards, we want to have a new schedule. So now I can actually say move unhandled future operations. So everything that is not pinned and that is now right from the scheduling start can get moved to standby. And then it is back on standby. After a while, we have to collect them all. We have to get them back to standby. And then I can say, now that I have them all back on standby, starting from next week, Tuesday, I want to schedule them all again. And then I get a fresh new schedule following the principles of our finite capacity scheduler. So again, this makes creating um, scenarios of your schedules and versions of your schedules and different different yeah different uh, different aspects of your schedule much more efficient so then um then the next thing is and you see i have i have my machining part and I have my assembly part and I have my quality control part. And sometimes we had the case, like I said earlier, that customers, for example, want to kind of do a very granular scheduling on, uh, on um, they want to do a very granular scheduling on their machining part, but they say, okay, actually, like when it comes to quality control, we don't care for granular scheduling. We want to treat uh, like quality control or some of these downstream processes like packing or whatever. We want to keep, treat them as if they would work with infinite capacity. So what we can do is actually now on the on both a machine center card or on a work center card, we added a new field where we can say, hey, actually here we want to schedule with infinite capacity. And here, like same, we want to schedule with infinite capacity because I don't care for quality control. As soon as it comes out of assembly, they need to do the job. And now it's like this, nothing changed yet because we just changed the property. But now on the right mouse click, I can say fill idle time. And then we bring everything forward, taking into account that we have infinite capacity. And let me just show another thing. Um, it's show operation stacked. And now you see, we brought them here with infinite capacity. I do the same on the quality control center, uh, uh, quality control machine center two. I say fill idle times. And now we treat this downstream process as it would have infinite capacity. So whenever something comes out of assembly, we immediately start 
in quality control. Whenever it comes out from here, we immediately start. And you could do the same with assembly if assembly would be a no-brainer. No so now what you see what is happening if you have this infinite capacity uh, uh, on, of course, you create overloads. Uh, but the, the point of, of selectively deciding what you uh, schedule with infinite capacity is that you don't care for uh, for overloads so but what happens is that these boxes these operations start to kind of stack and and if you say i really don't care and i don't want this machine center to take that much space you can on the right mouse click say hey i want to show the operations overlapped in one row then you just see there is work and but you do not get the differentiation again and then if you if you scroll down, uh, if you if you expand here with a mouse wheel, then you might see okay here are some overlaps because the the text gets blurry. Then you can say okay, uh, actually I want to check. I want to check um, what what we have there. So my system currently works very slow. Um, not sure why. If this is my bandwidth here or so then I can say show operation stacked and then with this I see again which operations are now scheduled here to happen at basically the same point of time so you have this capability now to first decide that a work center or a machine center works with infinite capacity. And then you can def define also on the right mouse click here if you want to see the operations overlapped in one row or if you want to see them stacked. And this is the right mouse click here on the machine center or on the work center. So then the next thing that I, I will just show you how it works is, and you know that we have something called EMAT earliest material availability date um, in the VAPS. And let me just take now one of the standard things. Let's take me the Paris guest chair. So if for some reason, um, let's assume the Paris guest, guest chair is just one item that uh, I also, uh, that, that's one, one item, uh, uh, that uh, that I purchase for whatever a production order. And then sometimes there, there, there is cases that we heard from customers that they have items that they can actually purchase right away. So what they told us is we have this particular item and this particular item is something that should never become like a bottleneck in scheduling. So we don't want the earliest material availability date to be influenced by this item because whenever we need this item we can just we can just purchase it in a shop next to us so basically this item is never unavailable even if it is don't if it's not yet in our system and so for for this case that you want to exclude an item from the earliest material availability date calculation you can say hey I want to exclude this from the earliest material availability date calculation. So if you have not only items where you do this, but if you have a certain category of items, so if there is, you have the standard field item category uh, code. And if you want to exclude like all chairs from the EMAT calculation, then you can do this as well. So you can go, to the item category code, item categories, and on the item categories. So, for example, if you want to exclude all chairs from the EMAT, you can you can view this. And here, I could say exclude from EMAT again, and this would mean every item that has the item category code chair would get excluded from the EMAT calculation. So you can exclude an, an item from the EMAT calculation either by selecting a single item or by selecting the 
item category code to which this item belong. And this kind of also can make things quite easy. If you have some commodity material that uh, for which you have a, a, a certain item category code and you never want an item that has this item category code be part of the EMAT, just flag this on the item category code as not part of EMAT calculation. And then we will exclude it automatically for all those items that have this code. Um, I said this was a request that came from two customers. Um, I'm happy that we delivered this now, and I think this can be useful for some of them. Then the last thing is, let me quickly go back to the visual view. Just here in this case, you see I have my business central set up in a way that we assumed customers would had set it up initially, like we have a, a work center group, we have a work centers, and we have a machine centers. Then we have this standby resource that shows me all those uh, operations or those production orders that are added or changed in Business Central and that I, as a scheduler, have to bring to the schedule. In the past, when there was no machine center defined um, uh, among uh, under a work center, we didn't show the standby resource. So for those customers who just had work centers, um, it was tough to work with the VAPS because we didn't show the standby resource. And hence, initially, when the things uh, when the production orders were scheduled in Business Central, we couldn't show them in the VAPS. So let me quickly switch now. Um, for the last couple of minutes, my environment and go to a database uh, where I have uh, it set up exactly as I just described. So uh, let me, I am already here, let me create a simulation and have a look at this. And now here in this database, I only have work centers. So this is work center, preparation, sawing, drilling, milling, no machine centers. And now you see we have a standby resource on these work centers. And I also said, you see this, I said this work center, please schedule with infinite capacity, preparation, and also in the end, like uh, assembly and quality control, infinite, but I want to schedule sawing, drilling, milling, and, 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 and welding. So now also from here, I can say schedule at all. It will fetch all also those left from the scheduling, uh, left from the work date, and it will schedule them starting from the scheduling start. Um, you see here it's infinite capacity. So if I would say again, show operation stack, then we would see, okay, a lot of stuff in preparation, but because I set it to infinite, I really don't care. So I want to see them overlapped, I, but I want to see and, and maybe I can even do like this because like actually I really don't care about assembly and quality control and about preparation. Um, but I care about sawing, uh, uh, drilling, milling and welding. Um, the thing is we treat every production order here, uh, we treat every work center with finite capacity of one. So independent of what you set here as capacity right now, um, we just facilitate to show data when you only have work centers set up without machine centers, but we ignore the value that you put on the work center card in the capacity field. This is something we definitely will work on this year, but um, a timing not yet decided, something that we will figure out by the end of next week uh, when, when, we, when we are going to do this. But right now we treat a work center as we treat a machine center with finite capacity of one. So this is the stuff that we built um, and shipped shortly before Christmas. So everything I showed you is available. It is available for VPS, VAPS, and VJS for Business Central version 19, 18, and 17. Just looking ahead on some of the stuff we are working on right now, um, we actually will do a lot of housekeeping, a lot of internal work in the first quarter of this year. Um, we we found some areas where we we um, saw and we know that with some redesign and with some cleanup, we can gain some further performance improvements. So this is something that that um, we will focus on 
very much in the first quarter. So we will look like internally in our product and from time to time, and you know this from your home, you know this from everywhere from time to time, it's just time not only to buy new stuff, but also to clean up what you have. And to some, some degree, this is something we will do quite over proportionately in the first quarter of this year. Um, because this then on also some of the redesigned things that we will do internally will uh, prepare the ground for some of the things that we are going to build starting Q2. Functionality wise in the VAPS, um, we will speed up the uh, EMAT calculation. So this for us is like a perf uh, increasing the performance of the calculation is for us, we treat it like a feature and with the earliest material availability date, we looking at an attempt to get this from production order line level to the routing line level. So um, we aim at taking into account routing link codes uh, when we do the EMAT calculation. And this is like, like from, the, from the work and conceptually, this is quite a big thing. And then we will provide a new scheduling functionality with which we just can squeeze things on a machine. So we will like tighten the machine queues and I will show you in a couple of weeks. With the VPS, we will we will add more warning symbols and visual alerts in the table. So like I showed you with the overlap, we have some additional ideas what, what we can do. We will play around with this and, and we definitely will provide more of those. With the VJS, we have a big topic when, when because you can create link conflicts right now and we, we want to improve the way of how they are handled both from the user perspective but also internally and we aim at bringing milestones to milestones as a as a data type to business central and most likely we will add a project task type called milestones so that to not only just have just planning lines that shows you activities, but that you also have, that you can define via the VJS milestones that you then can see and manage also visually in the graphical planning board. So these are some of the things we are working on. There's a bit more happening, but those are the ones that I decided to share. And with this, um, I'm almost done with the hour. I'm done with what I wanted to share with you. I'm like all the time open for question and I'm also really open to engage, to discuss. Um, if we are not yet connected on LinkedIn, please send me uh, an invitation to connect. So then, then we can also uh, discuss there. If you uh, are very familiar with Business Central and Manufacturing and if you want to become guest to my Business Central Manufacturing show, a regular podcast on Business Central and Manufacturing, then let me know, send me an email. I'm happy to discuss with you and happy to have you there as a guest as well. And I don't see any question right now. So I said initially, the more question I get, the better I find the webinar. So I hope that the first webinar of the year wasn't as poor as the number of questions indicate. But anyway, I would like to thank you very much that you uh, that you were here with me today. Thank you very much that you're interested in um, or that you use or sell our product. And as said, if you didn't find time um, to ask the question during the webinar, please ask it later. I'm, I'm really happy to help. I'm really happy to discuss and I'm really happy to listen. So with this, thank you very much. Stay safe and healthy. See you soon in one of the next webinars. Bye-bye.